perspective. I'm your host, Lee Dreyer, and during the last several weeks, financial markets have been in a state of turmoil. And this morning, we're going to talk about one of the things that produce chaos in the markets, that being market manipulation. So, if you've ever wondered why the value of your 401k suddenly took a nosedive, or if you're a senior citizen on a fixed income, and you want to know why the cost of heating oil suddenly spiked, well, don't touch that dial. Because this morning, we're going to talk about market manipulators and how they're stealing money from all of us. And we'll also discuss what our tax dollars are, or more to the point, are not doing to eliminate the problem. And this morning, we're very fortunate to have with us frequent guest Michael Volpe. Now, for those of you who listen to the show regularly, we've mentioned that Michael is a conservative journalist, but it may come as at least a mild surprise that he's a former investment advisor and has written extensively on financial markets. Michael, good morning. It's great to have you back. Thank you for having me. Michael, before we get into methodology, give us just a few brief examples of how manipulation of the financial markets can hurt the average person. Sure. Well, the, the main way that it hurts uh, financial markets, it depends on what they're manipulating, but a lot of the things that market manipulators are manipulating are also hedged, uh, whether it's oil, heating oil, copper, all sorts of things. So when somebody manipulates those markets, that also costs the hedger more money to hedge, and that goes to your bill, yeah. whether it's uh, your gas bill or your your bill to fill up your car, and, and all kinds of things. Uh, you know, the, the clothes that you're wearing may be slightly more expensive because somebody's hedging was more expensive. And because the minute they're they're hedging because the market's being manipulated. Right. They're, they're hedging. They're hedging for a number of different reasons. However, the, the markets being manipulated makes it more expensive for them to hedge. It's the, it's more difficult to get to get a good price, and by hedging, uh, the, the 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 markets can go out of whack. But it it's it's not that it increases it exponentially. It increases it very very slightly. But everybody's uh, gas bill or or. Uh, the, the take of gas for everyone goes up just a little bit. You don't see it, uh, but but it's definitely there. Yes, yeah, so you might call it a manipulator's tax, only it ain't going right. to the government. Not that that always does very much good, but it's not going to the government. It's going to the market manipulators. Uh, now, this morning we don't have time to discuss many of the techniques that people use to manipulate the market, but we're going to talk about one specific method that you've written extensively about. It's called spoofing. What exactly is spoofing, Michael? So spoofing is when somebody places a whole bunch of orders they don't want to what's called execute, meaning that, that, that the orders are there, but he's not actually buying and or buying or selling that what what's called a security. The orders are placed to make it appear as though there's a lot of movement on one side. This can be done with a buy or sell, but it's done to to manipulate the value of that security. And then what, what happens is that security goes in the direction they want, and then they go on the, the other side. So if they put in a bunch of buy orders, they weren't going to execute what, what we call execute it, then, then sell at a higher price. And their whole purpose was just to increase the price so they could sell. So they take a position and they either drive the stock, the price of the stock up or down using these phony orders that they later cancel. Correct. And then often they have real orders the other way. So if they're spoofing on the buy side, they're actually selling after the, the, the security has been spoofed. Okay. Now, a number of people don't understand this, but individual investors can make money when the market's going up, but they can also make money from a drop in the market, and there's certainly a couple techniques to do that. But let's talk about one very significant one when it comes to spoofing. It's called a short sale or simply shorting the market. So, Michael, exactly what is shorting, and how does somebody make money from it? Shorting a stock is, is when you sell the stock first, then you buy it back later. And so when you're shorting, you're expecting that, that security or that stock to go down. And it can also be a commodities future contract that you're shorting, correct? Co correct. So I think they, they use a different terminology. I think with a, like in, a, in options, I think it's called a put option, but it's basically the exact same uh, idea. But okay. Correct. All right. So when it, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, in all securities, there are ways to make money going up and going down. All right, what about the trader that says, wait a second, I'm just using my craft, my skills to, to, to convince the market to go in a certain direction. What's, what's wrong with that? By spoofing, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Right. No, you're, that, that's, not, that's not a craft. You're cheating. What you're doing is you're making it seem as though a lot of people are buying when they're not in order strictly to drive the price up. That's not craft. That's market manipulation. That's like the guy using a spitter saying, hey, I'm just trying to get a competitive advantage. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. Now, we t you talked about hedging and big, big trading firms and big hedge funds and big uh, mutual funds using having to use these techniques to hedge against risk but how does spoofing actually hurt the a or how can spoofing ha hurt the actual average investor well it can hurt it in a whole bunch of ways first of all if you have money with someone who is also trading that security, they're being hurt, so your money is being hurt. Uh, if you only have market manipulators in in the markets, uh, or if you have a lot of them, you're driving out the regular market participants, so you're, the, the market becomes disjointed. There's all sorts of, of, of ways that the average investor is hurt. You don't see it because it's, it's happening on a second-by-second second basis, and if you're the average investor, you're not paying that close attention. Mm, okay. Now let's talk about something that really hurt some IRA and some 401k accounts. It was called the flash crash of 2010. Tell us about that, please. Well, it was, I don't remember the exact amount, but the, the Dow and, and just about every stock, it was over like a 20 or 30-minute 30, 30 period, tanked very quickly, and then eventually it re regained uh, most of its value. And that, I believe, was actually an example of, of like a spoofing event that went out of control, and that just goes to show that these spoofers, uh, they, they, they often can't, uh, manipulate what they're trying to manipulate, but that was a spoofing event that just went out of control because they they showed certain amount of orders that, and the orders that went behind them were, were so significant that it caused this flash crash. Yeah, and we're going to talk about one very unusual spoofer involved in that. I think he took most of the blame for that. We'll talk about him a little bit later, but the Dow actually dropped something like 900 points in 10 minutes, and, and so, so how does it... How does it drop like that, 900 points in 10 minutes? How does that happen so quickly? Well, I, I think no one, even the participants, can't tell you exactly how it happens. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's spoofing that went out of control is, is the best way to describe it. This guy put in a bunch of orders, and that may, it, a, a lot of this is done what's called algorithmically. So it's computer program, programs which are... Uh, analyzing the and and you know that that's how it's unfair. They're analyzing the non orders that aren't supposed to be that aren't actually going to be traded. But as soon as this guy puts some in, all of these other programs followed, and uh, and before anybody knew it, you had this significant drop, and it basically fed on itself. Yeah, like the old joke, I guess it was. What was the difference between the crash in 1987 and the crash in 1932? Mm -hmm. 87, the computers jumped out the windows instead of the brokers. <laughs> right. Right. That, that, that's probably an inside joke. I'm not sure if anybody would get that, but I hope, I hope they do. Now, now we mentioned that, uh, that the, the market rebounded substantially and very quickly, but there's something called a stop loss that's actually a hedge against risk in and of itself, but can, be, can ensure a loss, <laughs> actually. So what, what exactly is a stop loss, Michael? So what a stop loss is, is it's like the minimum value that the, the security you own can go to, and at that value, it'll immediately sell. So, you know, let's say you bought, you bought a stock at 42, and, you, and if it fell below 38, you were done. So you would do a stop loss at 38, and if it ever got to 38 or lower, as soon as it broke through 38, it would, it would sell. And, and you said 38 or lower, and pardon me for interrupting you, that doesn't mean your stock is going to sell at 38. I mean, there may be a market yeah, gap, right. and it could end up selling at 30 or, or 25 even, right? It, theoretically, though, probably much closer to 38, but correct. Once it breaks through 38, then your stock is being sold. As long as there are buyers for it, it'll sell at, the, at that value. If there are no buyers, uh, it won't. I think with the flash crash, there was also... 
a multitude of these stop loss orders that started to get triggered. And I think even worse than that, it was basically this flash crash was just all these ten points of events. I think they were like staggered. So in my example, you know, I had one at thirty eight. Uh, and let's say there were like 50 people like me, and then there were another 50 people at 35, and another at 32. And it, as we all sold, it kept putting downward pressure to hit the next stop loss, which put even more downward pressure. And that's how it starts to feed on itself. Because, uh, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, the stock might be at 42, and they're very careful, you know, but maybe, maybe their stop loss is at like 22. Uh, so you have all of these stop losses at these staggered prices as. So the market drives and one hits, it puts even more downward pressure and it becomes this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, Michael, I think that's probably a good time to go to break. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, when we come back, we'll talk about a real life example of how stop losses actually cost someone a whole lot of money. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lee Dreyer, and you've been listening to the Conservative Law and Politics Show on Talk Radio 1510 WL. Does getting a flavorful, balanced, and convenient dinner on the table night after night feel like a chore? Let HelloFresh take care of the weekly meal planning so you can save time and actually have fun cooking and eating amazing meals. Visit HelloFresh.com and choose what meals you want from an ever-changing, customizable, and always delicious menu. Then let HelloFresh shop and deliver pre-measured ingredients with simple recipes that come together in around 30 minutes, have just six steps, and require minimal cleanup. But the best part? It costs less than $10 a meal. So if there's ever been a time to kick those 5 p.m. excuses, break out of your recipe rut, and take the first step towards unstoppable, it's now. Just go to HelloFresh.com slash family to get $30 off your first box. That's HelloFresh.com slash family for $30 off. HelloFresh.com slash family. Valentine's Day is around the corner and romance is in the air. Albeit very, very cold air. Why not warm up and warm hearts at the Rogers and Holland sale going on now? At Chicago's Family Jewelry Store for 108 years, they know all about making the special holiday one to remember. Don't miss out on 30% off all earrings and men's jewelry, 35% off diamond engagement rings, and even more surprise savings. Listeners, use promo code FOREVER for 10% off on any online order. Hiring is important. People are what make your business work. But how do you find the right talent? ZipRecruiter makes it simple. One click sends your job ad to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. Their smart matching technology will instantly alert quality candidates about your job. That means you'll start getting great candidates with the right experience almost as soon as your job is posted. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. The right candidates are out there. This is how you find them. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. People from businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. We're so confident ZipRecruiter will get you better results than anywhere else. We'll let you try it free. That's right, free. Just click the banner now or go to ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. See Wolf Zach Levine. Levine dropped 35 for Chi-Town. The Clippers beat Blake Griffin and the Pistons 108 to 95. Blake with 19 points for Detroit as they suffer their first loss with Griffin in the lineup. The Rockets curb stomp the Nuggets 130 to 104. LeBron James with a triple double for the Cavaliers. They get a victory in Atlanta. The 76ers 86, the Pelicans 182. Philly president Brian Colangelo says top overall pick Marco Fultz could miss the remainder of the season. Dwayne Wade would one for six and score three points in his return to Miami. They beat the Milwaukee Bucks. Sean Hannity. You can't make it up. This is CNN. Weekday afternoons at 2. The most trusted name in pot smoking. Talk Radio 1510. WLAC. Welcome back to the Conservative Law and Politics Show on Talk Radio 1510 WLAC. I'm your host, Lee Dreyer, and this morning we're talking about market manipulators and how they are stealing from every last one of us. But before we get back to our guest, Michael Volpe, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to mention that this show is the exclusive production of the Conservative Law and Politics Media Group, who is solely responsible for its content. The assertions and opinions expressed in the show are those of the participants and not those of WLAC or iHeartMedia. Now, speaking 
speaking of the show, for those of you who have questions about the program, you want to suggest show topics, or you're having a legal problem and need some free, once again, free legal advice, or perhaps you'd like to advertise on the show, please go to my website, www.leedryerlaw.com, hit the Contact Us button and send us an email. You can also call us at area code 615-576-0755, or you can send regular mail to Lee Dryer in care of the Conservative Law and Politics Show, 426 Century Court, Suite 102, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. Either way, if you contact me, rest assured, whatever method you use, I will respond. Now, Michael, I want to talk about a real-life example. This actually happened to a friend of mine. He's sitting at work. I think it was May 2010. Uh, he's got one of these college savings accounts for one of his children. It's decked out with stop losses everywhere. And he hears about the crash and, you know, and something about, oh, well, the market recovered his value. He breathes a sigh of relief. And then he goes home to find out that his account has been destroyed, lost, I don't know, 20% of its value in one day, something like that. It was pretty bad. And he's thinking, how can it happen? Well, because some of the, mar some of the stocks in his portfolio had a market gap. The stock, stock lo a stop loss, like we said, was actually executed below the price of the stop loss. So I think in our example, we said if the stock went below 38, uh, he had some of those 32s and 30s because there were market gaps in a number of the stocks. So, so how does that make you feel if you're him and you find out that due to market manipulation, you just lost 20% of your portfolio in one day? Right, you, you wouldn't feel good. And you know, using stop loss is, is effective if you, if you do it right. You know, if you bought the stock at, at 10 and it's now at 45, you know, you probably want to set a stop loss at, at, at a certain, you know, maybe 35 because no matter, you want to make sure you get out making money. Uh, so you'll ride it up. But hey, if this thing starts to pull back, uh, that's the bottom line. But if, if stop losses are being triggered, by market manipulation, that's a whole different deal. That's not your stock going down. That's somebody manipulating it to the price, to the price you set the stop loss at. And, uh, you know, that's basically fraud. Mm, or actually below the price you set the stop loss, stop right, loss right. at. Uh, what's a lot of, what a lot of people don't know about stop losses, by the way, if we did a disclaimer earlier, we should probably do a disclaimer here. Nothing on this show should constitute or should be taken as investment advice, nor should it be taken as legal advice or creating any sort of an attorney-client relationship. I may want to do that disclaimer every show. Uh, but anyway, just remember, none of this is to constitute legal advice or investment advice, and, and it shouldn't be taken that way. Uh, now, I think, as we alluded to earlier, many blamed a lot of the, the flash crash of 2010 of, on, on actually somebody that was trading out of his parents' living room over in England. Mm -hmm. His name was Mr. Navinder, I hope I'm pronouncing it, Navinder Singh Saro. So, Michael, how is it that one trader could cause so much havoc from the comfort of his parents' living room? Well, I think if you asked him, he'd probably say by accident. I don't think that his goal was to create a flash crash. His goal was probably just to, to push uh, the market down a percent or two and, uh, and do whatever he was trying to do. And as I said, it was, it was a confluence of events. You know, he, he moved at a time where there was a lot of stop loss orders in, in that general direction. And it just it spun out of control. But as I said, I think the reason he caused so much havoc is because it was done, it was by accident. Mm. Now, uh, let's talk about that for a second. The, uh, the financial markets are extensively regulated by a number of agencies. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. the Securities and Exchange Commission, there's the NASD, there's the Department of Justice, there's the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, there are a number of state agencies in this, in this state, securities are regulated by the Department of Commerce and Insurance, and that virtually every state has its own regulatory body, and there's you know, probably dozens of other entities that regulate them. And, and these are, are mostly funded by taxpayers' dollars, and they're trying to protect uh, the taxpayer, but they're not doing such a good job. How is it that with all those regulations, something like the flash crash of 2010 could actually happen? Well, the, the best way I can answer it is the, these regulators really do not have the electronic tools to do the proper auditing 
Uh, and at this point, uh, they have to rely on whistleblowers. There's a guy named uh, Tyler Gellish who testified at a House Financial Services Committee hearing. Uh, I think it was in December. He's, uh, he's with something called the Healthy Markets Association. He said because there's no automated way to link the trading and the underlying beneficial owner, there's actually very little chance to identify and stop sophisticated market abuses without a whistleblower. Then uh, trading and the underlying beneficial owner is basically the, to line up who makes trades to whom, and especially these trades that are canceled. Uh, remarkably, these regulators do not have the electronic auditing means to to do to do these kinds of audits. They need a whistleblower to to point them in the right direction. So we hand them millions of dollars, and they don't have the tools necessary to do their job. <laughs> Uh, that's yeah. sad. Yeah. Uh, a lot yeah, of this that's is really sad. true. Now, speaking of sad, here's another thing that really gets me. When these regulators do actually collect fines for violations of regulations, they generally don't go back to the investors or consumers that were hurt by the illegal activity. Michael, why not? Well, so sometimes they do. I mean, number one, they usually don't don't get all of the money that was disgorged. But these these regulators. They're in part self-funded through the fees they get. Uh, so the reason that the uh, the investors don't always get them is because that's how the, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and the Securities Exchange Commission to some degree fund themselves. Okay, let's move to something that I think many of us have heard of, the, the Dodd-Frank legislation that Congress passed in the wake of the stock market crash in 2008, another crash. Uh, Michael, if you would, give us a brief overview of Dodd-Frank. Yeah, it, it was to the financial services industry with the Affordable Care Act, was the health care, basically transformed financial services, all sorts of things, the way you can do your mortgages, the, the way you bank, uh, the, the kinds of investments you have, it's sweeping and, you know, we, we could take five shows and still not get through most of the legislation. Okay, now it's it's been criticized by a lot of conservatives, but let's talk about what it had to say about spoofing. What did it do for spoofing? So it was the first time that spoofing was identified, defined, and outlawed. However, it's very important to understand market manipulation has always been illegal. Uh, so spoofing was illegal in the sense that it's market manipulation. It's just it became like a new chic thing to do if you're if you're a shady trader. So they defined it, identified it, and specifically outlawed it. Okay. In Dodd Frank. All right. Now, we've talked principally about stocks to this point. Let's move to the commodities market. And, and many different forms of commodities are traded on financial markets. The price of everything from basically gold to pork bellies is determined largely by these markets. So, Michael, let's say there's a single parent out there working two jobs to support their family and the price of gas is a substantial part of their family's budget. Why should they be concerned about spoofing? How could it affect them? Well, again, because of the hedging, specific, especially with the things you're talking about, uh, um, oil, natural gas, those are other commodities. All of those commodities are traded, and many people are hedging them, and the price of, uh, of your heat, of your gas, is in part determined by the amount of money it takes to hedge, and when they're spoofing that hedging is more expensive. You know, one thing I always thought was funny, they would you know, watch a, f a financial news program and they'd list the price of oil and they'd say, you know, Brentwood barrel of light, sweet, crude. I mean, what do they taste it? <laughs> How do they know if it's sweet? <laughs> right. What does that mean? That must be a term of art or something for maybe low sulfur petroleum or something. I, I, I just always thought it was funny. Anyway, now, speaking of that, you live in a very cold place, and if I'm a senior citizen in your neighborhood and you're having a difficult time making ends meet, uh, does this particularly, does this affect the cost of my heating oil as well, this hedging, this Correct. manipulation? Yes, yes, because the, the hedging, which which is a... a not a good thing, but it, it's something. It's a necessary part of all of these businesses. Becomes more expensive when when you're hedging into a spoofer's market. Yeah. So yeah look, it's not that it's going to drive up your prices twenty or thirty percent. It's probably going to be something fairly insignificant. However, everybody's got to pay that much more. And why should anybody pay any more because somebody wants to spoof? 
Well, let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about a hedge. We talked about the stop loss earlier. It doesn't cost any money, at least directly. It could cost if it mm-hmm. if it goes through your stop loss. But there's something called a call and a put. So mm-hmm. a put is to hedge against downward risk. And you mm-hmm. buy it. So you so let's say that stop loss we talked about earlier at 35. Instead of that, you buy a put that gives you the right to sell the stock at 35 if it drops below that, or or the heating oil contract, or whatever it is. You have mm-hmm. to purchase that. That. And then when that buyer, and I, you know, a lot of people do this, Southwest Airlines, I know, hedges and has con- futures contracts, those type of people. So they, when they buy that, they have to incorporate that into the price of their end product, right? Correct. Uh, if I can, if I, I, I've got a great example. It's from a uh, movie. I, I don't know how many people have seen, but in East of Eden, uh, James Dean's character, basically, he, he becomes the speculator, but there's a guy who's planting his field who sells the futures and then he gets the price and the price he got is, is something that he can make money at. And that's a hedge because you're not going to go plant your field if you don't know how much you're going to get it. Yeah. So he sells that future. Now he's guaranteed the price. James Dean's character buys it. He's a speculator. He's hoping the price goes up because he's got it at, I think it was $3 per Per bushel or whatever it was, and if it's six dollars per bushel, when when the future comes due, then he's doubled his profit. All right, well, uh, but uh, that's we're going to have to go to break, Michael. I'm sorry, forgive me on that bit of film history. <laughs> uh, we're going to have to take a little break so the station can pay some bills. Uh, now, when we come back, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk more about whether regulators have actually fallen asleep at the switch. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Lee Dreyer, and you've been listening to the Conservative Law and Politics Show on Talk Radio 1510 W. Valentine's Day is around the corner. And romance is in the air. I'll be a very, very cold air. Why not warm up and warm hearts at the Rogers and Holland sale going on now? At Chicago's family jewelry store for 108 years, they know all about making this special holiday one to remember. Don't miss out on 30% off all earrings and men's jewelry, 35% off diamond engagement rings, and even more surprise savings. Listeners, use promo code FOREVER for 10% off on any online order. Hiring is important. People are what make your business work. But how do you find the right talent? ZipRecruiter makes it simple. One click sends your job ad to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. But ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. Their smart matching technology will instantly alert quality candidates about your job. That means you'll start getting great candidates with the right experience almost as soon as your job is posted. No wonder 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. The right candidates are out there. This is how you find them. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. People from businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. We're so confident ZipRecruiter will get you better results than anywhere else. We'll let you try it free. That's right, free. Just click the banner now or go to ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. ZipRecruiter.com slash iHeart. Cloudy sky with showers likely and a low dropping to 48. Some more heavy rain will be possible to the afternoon tomorrow with a high near 50. And a few breaks in the clouds later Monday with a high in the upper 40s. Powered by the Akron Mortgage Group, I'm Jeff Marr with the Weather Channel. News on the hour, on the half, and on demand. WLAC.com. Fox News Radio, I'm Karen McHugh. Democrats putting the spotlight in America's crumbling infrastructure in this week's radio address. We soon expect President Trump to release a plan that devolves the federal role in our infrastructure to the pre-Eisenhower era, placing the burden on the 50 states, territories, and local governments to raise almost all of the funds and encouraging them to sell off our roads, bridges, transit systems, and water systems to Wall Street and foreign corporations. Oregon Democratic Representative Peter DeFazio, winter making its presence felt in the Midwest this weekend. It's been this really narrow band of snow cutting right here across parts of Illinois and towards Michigan. That's kind of been the bullseye of it. Some spots have seen around uh, maybe say 9 to 11 inches or so we'll see another inch maybe two throughout the weekend with this band uh it's kind of just been looking the same for about the last couple of days fox meteorologist rick reichmuth the heavy snowfall playing havoc with air travel fox news we are to port you decide rush Hannity, and fox news talk radio 1510 wlac 
back to the conservative law and politics show on Talk Radio 1510 WLAC. I'm your host, Lee Dreyer, and we're here with journalist Michael Volpe, also former investment advisor Michael Volpe, and we're talking about market manipulation and how it is basically theft from all but the manipulators, including us, by the way. Now, before we get back to our guest, Michael Volpe, I'd like to mention once again this show is the exclusive production of the conservative law and politics media group, who is solely responsible for its content. The assertions and opinions expressed in the show are those of the participants and not those of WLAC or iHeartMedia. So we're back with Michael. Now, Michael, let's talk about one of the alleged watchdog groups. Uh, the commodities market is regulated by the Commodities Future Trading Commission. Who are they exactly? Well, they are a, a regulator, and they actually mostly they they regulate what's called the derivative market. So there's like the the direct security, like a stock of Apple, but the Apple option for that stock that's the derivative. So all derivatives. Uh, regulated by the Commodities Futures Trading Commissions and all commodities are, are, are also regulated by them. Yeah, a futures contract is also a derivative. Correct, right. correct. A futures contract is also a derivative. I mean, correct. you're not you're not trading an actual bushel of wheat. You're 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 agreeing to purchase or sell a bushel bushel of wheat some date in the future at a specified price, not the price today, right? Correct, and they do, and and the price of that futures contract is derived from the price of a bushel of wheat. Same way with the Apple option is derived from the price of the stock. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Commodities Future Trading Commission. How are they actually funded? Do you know? I think they're partially funded through the taxpayers. They're they're a line item on the budget, but also through the fees they get by going after bad guys. Okay. Now, Michael, in, in your opinion, does the Commodities Future Trading Corporation do enough to prevent spoofing or any other sort of market manipulation, for that matter? They uh, they take victory laps when they act like they do enough. But no, in, in an investigation that I've done for a website called The Industry Spread, I have found that, that they do not. Okay. Now, does the Commodities Future Trading Commission have any incentive to treat larger traders or larger trading firms differently than they would a smaller firm or individuals? Yeah, yeah, they do. Why so? so? Because the larger firms trade so much that if you and if if they are uh, manipulators, and I found at least one, and I think there are several, you the, the trading volume would go down so significantly that uh, you, you basically frighten people. Um, they do, the, some of these guys I think are, are, are in the trading world, probably thought of as too big to fail. They trade so much that removing them from the market would reduce with what, what they call liquidity. But yeah, they do have an incentive. Uh, if you trade a lot, you earn a lot of power. Okay, so I guess the moral to the story is if you're a thief or a fraudster, better to be a really big thief or fraudster, right? Right, I think it was John Lipko's character. Uh, oh my God, I'm not gonna remember the movie, but to kill a few people, they call you a murderer. To kill a million, you're a conqueror. It's sort of the same way. Uh, yeah, if you're gonna I didn't see that. I don't remember that. Because you're. Uh, because you are going to be much more protected then. Correct? That's two movie references today, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, just so we'll get that straight. For those of you keeping score. All right, let's talk about some examples of this unequal uh, enforcement, I guess, for lack of a better term. Let's first talk about a Mr. Michael Kosha. Who is he? He's a, now a former trader out of Chicago. Uh, he had his own trading firm. I think it was pretty big. And uh, uh, that's, that's who he was. Um, and what he did is he, 